Good morning. Thank you all for coming to our Social Determinants of Health workshop. We're going to get started on time because we have a very big, busy schedule and we really want to give most of the time of the workshop to you to discuss and help us move forward on this issue. We will start with the tribute. We will start with the tribute to Dr. Harvey Beardmore, put together by Dr. Sharif Emil. Harvey Beardmore was born in 1921 to Scottish immigrant parents in Windsor, Ontario. His studies at McGill University in Montreal were interrupted by World War II where he proudly served as a lieutenant and platoon commander with the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry in Italy. Harvey then returned to Montreal and married his life partner, Francis Barnes, with whom he had six children. He earned his MDCM degree in 1948 and started surgical residency at McGill, rotating multiple times in what was then the Children's Memorial Hospital. In 1953, Dr. David Murphy, Surgeon-in-Chief at the Children's, established Canada's first pediatric surgery training program and one of North America's original five. Harvey Beardmore became the first fellow and subsequently joined the staff of what became the Montreal Children's Hospital. Beardmore would prove to be a visionary pediatric surgical leader of his time. In 1968, with Barry Shandling of Toronto, Beardmore founded the Canadian Association of Pediatric Surgeons and became its first president leading the organization for five years. His legacy to Canadian pediatric surgery was celebrated at the 50th anniversary of CAPS in 2018. The following year, he helped found the American Pediatric Surgical Association, becoming its fifth president in 1974. A year later, he became the first president of the newly formed World Federation of Associations of Pediatric Surgery. He also chaired the AAP section on surgery from 1969 to 1971. During those years, pediatric surgery was fighting for recognition and facing fierce resistance in the process. Three previous attempts at recognition from the American Board of Surgery were launched in 1955, 1960, and 1966. All failed. Undeterred by this, Beardmore launched the fourth attempt in 1972 he delivered a passionate appeal to the ABS in March 1971. Just over a year later, a special certificate in pediatric surgery was granted. As the 1973 ABSA meeting opened in Phoenix, Beardmore triumphantly declared, gentlemen, you have your boards. Having achieved so much on the international scene, Beardmore steered his leadership back to McGill in 1974 by assuming the Pediatric Surgery Program Directorship. His first fellow was Dr. Brad Rogers. Three decades later, as APSA president, Dr. Rogers bestowed upon him the Distinguished Service Award. Upon receiving news of the award at his retirement home in the Quebec countryside from Dr. Jean-Martin Laberge, Dr. Beardmore had this to say after a long emotional pause. To have been a member of the American Pediatric Surgical Association and to have partaken in its birth and reconstruction uh, over the years has been more than, than one like me deserves. Dr. Beardmore had also received the William Ladd Medal in 1986. Dr. Beardmore died on February 10, 2007, shortly after his 86th birthday. His legacy continues today through pediatric surgery at McGill and the dozens of graduates who have trained in the program he once led. Most importantly, his legacy endures through all of us who call ourselves pediatric surgeons and through future generations who will aspire for the same. And in honor of Dr. Beardmore, the Division of Pediatric Surgery at uh, McGill University will be called the Harvey Beardmore Division of Pediatric Surgery. 
So yesterday, many of us heard the data on the, the links of poverty, crime, poor health care. And you have heard or will hear the stories from some of these individuals and the challenges that they have put forth before us. And we heard from you in our survey that children in our, your communities are living in poverty, exposed to violence, exposed to substance abuse, lack access to healthy food and sometimes to health care, and that your top priorities are to address child abuse, violence, poverty, substance abuse. Most don't have much involvement at this time but are looking for ways to be involved. But over a third of us don't even know how our hospitals are involved. Healthcare occurs in a complex system and strategies are needed at all levels of the system, both top down and bottom up. There's no amount of attempting to address individual behaviors that will create lasting changes without using that context. Many of us, in fact all of us, help individuals and will continue to do that. But today we're here to discuss how can we do more, particularly in our own communities, and how can we as an organization do more for the health care of our nation and of all of our countries uh, together. Our objectives today are to understand the social determinants of child health, share your stories, why are you here, identify some possible actions, personal actions, institutional actions, association actions, articulate at least one personal next step. And the paper in front of you is for, the, uh, for you to do that at the end. So if you happen to use it to take notes during this, the um, workshop and then you need another piece, I have a stack here, so let me know. It is um, carbonless paper, so if you write on it, you will get a copy of what you wrote on the, on the yellow paper behind it. We're here to connect with other APSA members to enhance our impact and to provide input for what should APSA 5.0 look like. Today's agenda will cover these three topics and to lead us into the first topic is uh, Sherry Immediato. And she will introduce herself and tell her story. Uh, thanks very much, Marion. The carbon paper we were putting down. We might need some more. Uh, I'm going to come down here to be with you because the point of our time together is to talk to each other. And the first question may seem really obvious in terms of what brought you here today, but I'd like to share a little bit about why it's so important as you embark on this process together. Uh, I've been working in the field of community health improvement for the past 10 years and I've had connection to healthcare and public health for long before that. Uh, but what I came to realize from that earlier work was that the challenges and aspirations we have aren't going to be met by any one organization. It requires, uh, it requires as Adam was talking about yesterday, a gang. Uh, and you need something to sustain that work over time. And this simple question for me gets at that in terms of what brings us here, what calls us here. Um, so, so this is for the long haul. Can I actually get you to uh, kind of advance the slide? Thank you. Um, so this sign uh, appeared very close to where we're seated today. Um, we, where we are seated today was nothing but air over the Massachusetts Turnpike 40 years ago. The Department of Transportation decided that the air was going to waste. And so they came up with a scheme to sell the airspace over the turnpike, and ergo we have Copley Place that's sitting here. The realization of this aspiration helped fuel the actuality of the big dig in Boston. So it was putting the rest of the highway underground in the center of town. And, uh, and 10 years into this project, this sign went up. Uh, and, it, and it actually stood for 10 more years and had to be taken down because the project still wasn't finished. Um, but a complicated project has time and money. You know, if you've got enough of it, you've got a good plan. In this case, just a little humor to, to kind of deal with the challenge of living through it. You can get through it. 
But what we're talking about is way more complicated than that. And you know, Ron left us yesterday with Kennedy's words about this may not be done in our lifetimes, even those of you who are millennials, um, because there's something kind of here that really needs to be done that is generational. So who are we in coming to that? I know lots of you are here because I've been told you're very practical people. I am not a pediatric surgeon. I am uh, kind of a consultant and educator and policy wonk. Um, but, I, but I hear you're very practical people. And so you want to know what to do. Well, the first thing that you can do is to tell your story. You know, yesterday we heard Adam tell some of his story about being arrested. We heard Vic tell his story about comforting the mother, uh, kind of, of the, that was a gunshot victim. Um, so you signed up because somebody sent you an invitation or you heard something, but there's probably something about your life, some decision you made, some challenge you faced that has meaning that brings you here. So. I'm going to share three little snippets as examples of my story and then invite you to share yours at your tables if you just want to move that next. So this is what you're going to do in a couple minutes. So I really want to speak to that for the kind of this first piece. Uh, I was raised in this area. I've lived almost my whole life uh, kind of in a 40 mile radius of this place. And that included uh, going to school as a young child in southern New Hampshire. Uh, with the presidential election already coming into play, I think you can imagine how important New Hampshire has been over the years, and it certainly was in the 1960s when I was growing up. And I was really interested uh, kind of in the issues of the day, particularly in 1968. It was a tumultuous time. Uh, the war, the Vietnam War, was being recognized as a quagmire. Uh, the civil rights movement was struggling. Martin Luther King was assassinated. There was kind of a lot of uncertainty and various people trying to make proposals about what to kind of have happen. And uh, the big influence on me and all this in watching it was when Robert Kennedy threw his hat in the ring and started to talk about what he saw. Um, one of the things that he has been quoted as saying many times uh, was that he observed others, that some men would see things as they are and ask why. He would say, I dream things that never were and ask why not. That captured my young heart. And uh, when he was killed on June 6, 1968, I felt like somebody had kicked me in the stomach. It was as real as losing a family member. But it was really clear to me, to use the words Adam gave yesterday, I was part of the gang. And, you know, and what the gang or the team does is you know, take the place of whoever has, who, who can't be part of it anymore. And so it was a very conscious choice on my part to have, leave the world a better place than I found it. It's the simplest way I can describe it. Um, kind of into continuing that aspiration. So that's a big picture answer to the question. To come back to this place where we are, um, about 10 years ago I was working for a nonprofit organization and I was thinking it was time to do something different. Uh, but I was on what ended up being one of my final trips, uh, work trips for this organization. And uh, at the entrance to this underground place, uh, uh, kind of of the freeway, my taxi uh, to the airport on a very rainy, dark morning spun out of control and hit the side of the freeway and burst into flames. So I got out, obviously, since I'm standing here, uh, but it became clear to me that I had no idea how much time I had left. And I really should spend it doing what I thought was important and what mattered most. And so that caused me to shift into doing this work around improving community health. And last but not least, in that process, I got to know Vic Garcia a lot better and the work in Cincinnati. And a few months ago, he called me up and said, I see this opportunity at APSA and I think you can help. So one of the things I've learned is you don't say no to Vic Garcia and consistent <laughs> with the other parts of my story, I said yes. 
So that's about two minutes, about uh, something about who I am and why I'm here. So I'd like to invite each of you at your tables to take two minutes. So try to let somebody talk without kind of interrupting uh, so that everybody has a chance before anybody speaks twice. And I will give you two minute notices as you go through, okay? Um, so for somebody offer to go first and begin. I know there were a few bigger tables than we had planned. I'm sorry if a few people got left out or had to talk very fast. Uh, so I know that you came because you wanted to talk about what to do. But this is one of the things you can always do. I mean, how many of you feel more energized and more confident uh, after hearing people's stories about being able to do something? You know, there's a lot of positive energy. My guess is you learn something about people. If I, how many people feel like they know the folks at their table better than they did when they walked in? Yeah. Uh, and this is probably not what you expected to do 10 minutes ago when you walked in the door. Um, but this is always available and kind of asking this question about why are we doing this and how do we talk to other people about why we're doing this. You know, your stories are compelling and they matter and they may continue to change uh, kind of as you get into this. But thank you for starting off. I'm going to turn it over to Vic to talk about, okay, if this is what we care about, uh, how do we begin? Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Vic Garcia, and I'm told that I'm a pediatric surgeon. <laughs> uh, I have rarely been as excited as I am today, this morning. Um, you know, we go into pediatric surgery sort of appreciating that the challenge that we have is one of life requires lifelong learning. Uh, I am learning more on this path that I'm taking in, which I'm inviting you to participate in, in such a very short period of time, I'm learning more than I ever, ever imagined. And I'm having so much more fun and excitement and a feeling of accomplishment and also, yes, a feeling of obligation than I've ever had in any other phase of my pediatric surgical career. This is arguably one of the most pressing, if not the most pressing existential challenge that we face. And we as committed professionals to deal with the health and well-being of children, this is our lane, this is our purview, this is our responsibility. We can no longer remain ignorant or unaware that this is not a problem to be solved, but that this is really a complex issue that we need to truly understand. How do we begin? Where do we start? Well, prob primarily, it's really understanding that we can deal with the symptoms. You have to stop the bleeding, but we have to then truly understand that every aspect of policy in this country is a health policy that will deal with these health disparities. Does that make sense? Okay. That we then can begin to appreciate the most essential aspects of it, and that is basically that this is not a problem to be solved, but this is a complex issue that we need to understand, and that's where we have to begin. Now, I was not fortunate enough to be here when Adam spoke, but I think he touched on many of the aspects that we're going to really need to appreciate as we move forward, as we understand this. How do we understand what's happening in your own community? And you touched on that. Understanding, again, the complexity of it, Learning about that is one of the most exciting aspects of this work. And if we go about truly, simply trying to solve a problem, uh, then we will s stop the bleeding, but there will be more children than coming down our path, down the river, if you will, bleeding. And as I walked around, I heard so many stories, some with emotion, some of the speakers in tears about what they see and now what they feel empowered to do something about. So we need to sort of learn what are the lessons that have been learned out there, what are the things that have been accomplished. And I think with Adam's help, we're going to learn a little bit more about some of the nuances getting down granular. All right. So without further ado, let me ask Adam Foss to come up and sort of 
bring this then to the real. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, also walked around the room and heard a lot of great things about why people are here. Uh, raise your hand if you are here because you care about children living. Okay. So, like, let's have a, a level setting, uh, sort of like three rules about what we can do um, about these intractable problems and where they're coming from. Um, number one, this is not an appendectomy. You're not going to walk out of this session and be like, woo, got it. Uh, number two, it's really hard, uncomfortable work. And it needs to, sort of like following up on number one, it needs to be part of your culture all of the time. Uh, and you can't half-ass it. If people aren't feeling uncomfortable, if feelings aren't getting hurt, you're not doing it right. Uh, you, have to, you have to have discomfort. Um, because we broke a bone a long time ago and it healed improperly. And so to fix it, we need to break it. Uh, and number three, uh, people are dying. Children are dying every single day because of this problem. And so if you are committed to the work and you take that as a truth that many thousands, if not millions of children will die uh, because of these problems that are in our hospitals, not because we're bad doctors or we don't have the equipment, but because there's something else in our way. Um, if you are committed to saving children's lives, then you have to be committed to putting these processes into place as an individual, as an institution, and as an organization. Uh, and I say all of that to say, uh, I understand there are only 24 hours in your day. The number one pushback I hear from people all the time is like, I don't have time. I don't have time to do that. But before that comes out of your mouth, the next time, just think about uh, what you're saying. Is that you cannot be creative enough with the 24 hours in your day or the all, several hours in your week or the several hours in your month to figure out how to save people's lives. It's fundamentally what you're saying. And so you have to commit to finding that time. And I'll give you an example. Uh, every person that pleads out to a case in criminal court has to answer several questions about the rights that they're giving up. Uh, and those questions are, what's your name, what's your age? And the third question is, what level of school did you achieve? What is the, the last level of school that you achieved? And I stood next to easily 40,000 people in my entire time in the criminal justice system, and I think maybe five had ever said, I graduated from high school. And then when you're going through the form that they're giving up their rights on, uh, there's another 80 to 90 percent that can't read the form, even though they completed the ninth grade or the 10th grade or the 11th grade. And as a result, we're seeing lots of men and women who are unable to get jobs or get housing or anything like that because of the fundamental lack of literacy that happens to them, not because they're black or brown or stupid, but because the schools that they went to did not know how to teach children how to read who were coming from toxic environments. We as an educational system evaluate children on their ability to read, to learn how to read, and then to learn from reading. It's how you're evaluated for the rest of your life. From zero to five, zero to six, we're, we're taught how to read, and then we transition over to being evaluated on how good we can do that. So eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, you start seeing standardized testing, and you're being evaluated by that. And we break kids up into groups. Here are the kids that got it, here are the kids that don't. And we ascribe shame and value judgments to those children that don't, because, and we're, bl we're basically blaming them for their inability to learn how to do the first part. And that's very frustrating when you're being evaluated on something that you didn't get to have, not because you're stupid, but because somebody didn't figure out how to teach it to you. And that frustration manifests not through words, because at 8, 9, and 10 years old, we can't articulate to you why we feel this way. So it manifests in other ways, and that's behavior. We act up, we act out, we run around the class, classroom, the class clown with a class problem. We're kicking the seat in front of us, we're pulling hair, we're biting, we're snapping. Not because we're a behavioral problem, not because there's something wrong with us, but because we're so frustrated that we're being evaluated on the skill that the adults failed to teach us. And in that moment, what do we do as adults? Do we apologize? Do we say, well, we'll figure something else out. Maybe this isn't the right way. No. We blame kids. 
We shame them. We punish them. We are suspending and expelling kids from preschool at this point in time. And guess what? The racial disparities are out of control, even in, at the preschool level of suspension and expulsion. You suspend a black boy one time in this country between the ages of 8 and 12, you've increased the likelihood that he drops out by 50%. 70% of the black men in, in prison right now are high school dropouts. I'm not a statistician, but that seems pretty causal to me. And so taking all of this information in as a, as a prosecutor, if all of, the, all of the people who are dropping out are the guys who started when they were five and six and seven years old, not being able to put a sentence together, not because they were just coming to school with so much stress in their head, if I know that they will go on because of social determinants, to not have the access to a job, and therefore be more likely to commit crime, then my job as a prosecutor is just as important to make sure that these kids are learning how to read. And that's like, I'm hoping that you are seeing the connection here in your work, that the person that you get on your table, that something has been happening for a while now, or you can prevent something from continuing to happen in the future, that might not sound like your job, but who says it's not your job? If the ultimate goal is to save this child's life, then what does it matter if you're talking about reading or housing or medicine? You have them there in front of you. And so as a prosecutor, I was like, man, I, I can do something about that. Because I could have said, I don't have the time to do it. I don't, I don't have time for that. I work every day, bartend at night, I'm tired. I have a huge caseload. Those are somebody else's kids. But then I was like, you know what? Elementary school starts at 7 a.m. in Boston. My workday starts at 9, 8.30, <laughs> for the overachievers. And in those mornings, I was either like sleeping in because I was tired from the bar the night before, or I was like going to get coffee and hanging out with my friends before work to shoot the shit. And I was like, maybe I can take some of this time, maybe I can use my privilege that I have in that time and do something else. And so we started going to one area of elementary school with four prosecutors. And we would read, I walked in thinking I knew anything about children. And so I walked into the principal's office and I was like, I would like to bring volunteers in here to read uh, every Wednesday morning. And I'd like an hour with your kids. And they just laughed at me. <laughs> they were like, you think you're going to read to these kids for an hour? Great, great, great. <laughs> Tell you what, we'll start with a half hour and we'll go from there. So we had four prosecutors, one day a week in one school. By the time I left, we had uh, 60 prosecutors in 11 schools across the city every single day, every morning, reading to children. In the, in the first effort, it was, yes, let's, let's like increase the 30 million word gap. I knew that it wouldn't get everybody, but maybe that one kid, that one kid might gain something from this that would help his literacy to help him, help him succeed. And I'm sure that has happened. I have seen, I've met children who I've, I've seen in, in middle school and now in high school because the program is going on so long, that are excelling in school and they attribute that a lot to being read to not just in the kindergarten grade, but we follow them all the way until the fifth grade. But then there were other amazing ancillary benefits that we hadn't even talked about. Every, every prosecutor that had gone into that school, the first time that, that they had seen a black or brown child was either as an abuse victim or a, crime, or a, a perpetrator of a crime. Think about that. And then ask yourself about your worlds. The first time that they had interacted with a black child was in their workplace. And so when you took them out of the workplace and put them into their classroom and into an environment, you saw these prosecutors who had demonized and, and, uh, and had all of these biases about black people, you saw them you saw the implicit bias reducing them because they were like, man, you act just like my kid. Wait, you like Baby Shark too? Weird. <laughs> the other beautiful uh, sort of answer to benefit was children were seeing lawyers and police officers and judges in their classrooms before they saw them in a courtroom and started asking questions about our careers and started seeing pro prosecutors that looked like them, lawyers that looked like them, and asking questions about that and, and growing. And we did this for years, and now one thing that I think uh, has not been articulated is that we all suffer a lot of vicarious trauma. 
We all suffer a lot of like secondhand trauma because of the nasty things we see with young people all the time. Uh, I, I truly believe that we had so much buy-in because people felt better coming to work. It wasn't all doom and gloom. They could see kids thriving and surviving in an environment. And in this school district, in this little pocket of schools, we've increased graduation rates to, to the middle school. We've increased graduation rates through the high school. Is that all because of us? I don't know. But I know that we did something. And so that's just like to, to bring context to the conversation about a, a method that you can use to get yourselves out of your hospitals and offices and into the community in a way that is attacking one of these social determinants of health. All right? I'm going to set the landscape of sort of like three buckets of things, but I just want to check back in with the good doctor to see how we're doing because I, I perhaps some more context around the social determinants would be great. Sure. Uh, is this mic on? Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So let's think about this. Let's do a thought experiment. All right. There's a lot that we know as far as how health disparities are perpetuated, and they're perpetuated, okay, thought experiment by neighborhood, neighborhood context. All right. So I'm going to list out a few things and, uh, as sort of appetizers for you to discuss this at the table, thinking about what you could do in your environment given what I'm going to share with you. Is that okay? All right. So Adam referred to the toxic environment. How many of you are familiar with Nadine Burke Harris's work uh, in toxic environment, toxic stress? How many of you? Raise your hands. Okay. So toxic stress turns out to be one of the most important influences on impairing child learning. Adam mentioned as far as the importance of reading. We know that prisons are being built depending on the reading level at the year of three years of age. What we don't know is the fact that poverty is now, related, is now recognized as a causal effect on surface brain area impairing child's neurocognitive ability on functional MRIs as early as four weeks of age. Okay. We now know then that we can actually implement things in your toxic, in, your, in, your, in the neighborhood to address that. It's called trauma-informed care. So we have poverty, but it's not just poverty alone, it's concentrated poverty. Do we understand that? It's individual poverty as well as poverty in a neighborhood. What are your neighborhoods where your children's hospitals are, where you work? How do they fit that definition of concentrated neighborhood poverty or concentrated disadvantage. What is concentrated disadvantage? It's not only having an impoverished in individual, but it's also having female heads of households. It's also the number of children in those neighborhoods, okay, and the number of individuals in, well, on welfare. How do, are your neighborhoods where your schools, where your hospital is, um, sort of fit that demographic? Is that right? Do you, do you hear that? Okay, what else? What about the racial ecology of lead poisoning? We know that lead poisoning, not only does it affect one's ability to learn, but it also affects violence in a neighborhood. We also know that violence in and of itself in a neighborhood, particularly a segregated neighborhood, impairs what? It impairs learning. It impairs executive function. How is violence in your neighborhood then? Okay, present or not present? But here's something else that's amazing, that in those neighborhoods, equal in poverty, there's differences in violence. And that particularly is a result of something called collective efficacy. Bob Putnam calls it social capital. It's people coming together, trust. How is that in your hospital setting? We also know you heard Dante Ingram yesterday, right? Okay, Dante Ingram, he had an opportunity. He's asked for opportunity. When I began this work, we did a focus workshop in a safe place where we had gangs coming in, and they asked us, uh, we asked them, what do they need to stop the violence? They said five things. The first three were what? A job. What was the second? What? A job. What was the third? Smart group here. Uh, smart. A job, right? And then the, the fourth was expunge my record, right? And the fifth was child support in arrears. 
You see, the child support in arrears was really a tax on the meager money that they were able to make. And so the, the decision making was, why in the hell will I get a job if you're going to tax it at 60 percent where I can just take the money from what? An informal drug economy. So I'm laying out a few things to help you then spend a few moments at your table to talk about, and I could go on and on and on, but, uh, you know, Ron, he wouldn't like that, okay? But these are just a few things for you to discuss at your table. Is that helpful to begin the conversation? Okay. Let the games begin. So what we, so what we'd like you to do now is come back to your tables and discuss amongst yourselves and then we're going to share with the group. But what are some steps that you as an individual can do? What more do you need to know? What more do you need to find out about your communities, your hospitals? But what steps do you want to do? Can you do? What steps can your hospitals take? And what steps could APSA take? And we want you to discuss this amount amongst yourselves at your table, and then we're going to have a big group discussion. This is really the meat of the workshop. This is where do we go from here. And then at the end, we'll have you uh, write some sort of challenges to yourself on the paper, but we'll get to that. But Yeah, so about 15 minutes now to discuss with your table mates what's, what, what can we do individually, as hospitals, and as APSA. And Adam has... Before, before we get there, so like, this is the thing that happens in all of these rooms. It's like, we need to fix it. <laughs> we know there's a problem, we need to fix it. And when you do that, it becomes a box check. Like, I, I spend a lot of time in the private economy, like in big businesses, talking about diversity and inclusion. And I want to scream because they're like, ugh, this is affecting our business, we need to fix it. Come and give a talk, and we'll be done. No, 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 no. This is, this has to be, this, you have to feel this. It has to be in your fiber. You have to want this, not because it's politically expedient or because you'll make more money or because your hospital will get better ratings. You have to feel this because people are dying and our, and our economy is suffering and our communities are not as diverse and rich as they should be. You have to feel it. And so if there are things that you're like wondering about your community, it's okay to be like, I don't actually know what the housing situation is like from, from our people. I don't actually know how many single households there are. I don't actually know how many black mothers that I'm seeing have gone through an eviction not once but twice this year. And what is that doing to the health of the children that are coming to see me? Eviction drives lots of young people to see you. So like spend a few minutes just on like, what do we need to know? And then we can brainstorm about things that we can do, but then we'll come back and I have a list of things for you to do that sort of fall into three buckets, all right? So like, Get into it, be uncomfortable, say whack things, it's okay. And then we'll get into like, how do we solve the problem? Because we can't go to the solution without understanding the depth of the problem, not just on their side, but on our side. All right? And Adam, is it okay for us to serve as resources as we yes. walk around? Okay. Yes, we will sit at tables and serve as resources. Oh, it's good. It's good that you, it took that long to stop talking. It's good. <laughs> Uh, and I hate to break, up, break the cipher. Um, okay. Heard a really a lot of good conversations. Uh, I will say as an observation, I feel like we are, diagnose, we are uh, prescribing before we are diagnosing problems. I stole that from my friend over here. That wasn't, my, that wasn't mine. Uh, but it is a, a categorization of what we, and this is what we do. We want to fix the problem. We need to solve it, prescribe something. Uh, with less diagnosis than I think that we need to be doing. And this is part, this is sort of like part of our share back. Um, and, uh, and I'll frame it in this way. Uh, all of us are addicted to narratives that we've been fed since we were children. And as a result, we see these disparities in every, every system that operates in the public sphere in some way has these disparities. You saw the one about premature deaths and homicides. The people who are affected by these disparities are the people who are affected in the same communities by the public health system, the public education system, the criminal justice system, public housing. The reason that they are, are failing and being failed is beca not because of them, but because the same people run all these structures. 
And the same people who are running these structures grew up in the United States of America, and as such, we've been affected, we've been infected with these narratives that we have that were created at the time we started capturing people on the shores of Africa and bringing them here and subjugating them to work for us for free. We had to do things to convince ourselves that that was okay, and we've continued to do that throughout history. And as a result, the work that we have to do now is actually decondition ourselves. We have to unlearn things, and to do that, we have to understand that buildup. What got us here? So we can, we can volunteer and we can go vote, we can come up with great ideas, we can come up with new policies, we can come up with new laws, but unless we deal with the, the addiction that we have, unless we heal ourselves, then it doesn't matter what the words on the page say or the activities that we have at the work, it has to come from within. And that requires uh, work. And what is the first step and 12 steps of recovery. Admit you have a problem. So can we all admit in here that we have work to do because we don't have a grasp of why, these dis like why we are causing these disparities? Can we all agree that we have work to do? There is a problem here. We are failing. Can we agree on that? Great. First step taken care of. There's a bunch of other steps. We don't have time for them right now. We're going to get to uh, some open reflection and then to uh, sort of more structured what can we do as institutions, as organizations, as individuals. All right? So let's just share out. I'm going to pick a table here. What did you guys come up with during your discussion about what the problems were and what you can do about them? So I'm Wolfgang Steyer, and we talked about really approaching our patient interactions with curiosity and starting the conversation in the hospital that this is a problem and that we are part of it. And not going to the fixing and not saying we need a scribe or we need another caseworker or we need another social worker, but really going in and having the conversation about there is a problem that is upstream of what we're seeing and through starting the conversation and then maybe expanding into grand rounds or lectures or guest speakers or whatever it is to really populate the, the conversation and the topic so that then people can engage and go forward. But the key for us was to approach the situation with curiosity about the patient that's in front of us. How many of you feel comfortable doing that? How many, do you feel, how many of you feel you have the tools Excellent. to do what he's saying. Great. Great. Okay. We can do that. What else? Uh, let's go to the table back here. Um, I had made the, it's Gail Besner, uh, pediatric Gail. surgeon. I had made the comment that I had recently seen a doctor, and when the nurse put me in the room, they asked me a lot of questions about, do I feel safe in my own home? Do I feel that I you know, could be exposed to ver verbal abuse, physical abuse? They asked a lot of personal questions about me. But we don't really ask that of our patients. Our nurses put the patients in the room, and we get a lot of you know, history about review of systems and past medical and surgical history. But we never get a question uh, or ask them any information about, have you been evicted from your home? Uh, is there, are there guns in your home, uh, drugs in your home? Do you feel safe? Are your children safe? And so it just occurred to me that we could at least have them fill out some kind of a questionnaire if they feel comfortable answering those types of questions so that we could understand the magnitude of the problem. And then if we have some data and some numbers, we could potentially um, you know, seek sources of help for these patients that might not be um, initially apparent that they even need. How many others in the room sort of had thoughts about that first patient interaction, the question that we're asking them? Okay. When I hear that, I, I love the idea. I'm concerned about the practice. Can anybody tell me why? Se what does checkbox mean? It becomes a checkbox. It becomes a, we did it, we checked the box off. Okay. Okay. That's a concern. Not my first concern. Who are you going to ask the questions of? Say more about that. Well, I, that, that you would 
you would discriminately ask, uh, uh, for instance, they'd ask all the African-American kids about the guns in the family, but the kid from the suburbs is not going to get asked that question. And it's going to, from the outset, get them to feel like they, they're being treated differently than the other kid is. All right. So you know what you just did? You acknowledge a problem before it happened. So you can like bake into it some objectivity uh, by just asking everybody. We just ask, everybody gets this questionnaire. Um, checkbox thing is again, like that is a, we have to incentivize that. How do we incentivize that? Are we, are we checking, are, are we reviewing that after the fact to make sure that it's being done? Do you want, I think he's got a response to that. We talked at our table about having more open-ended questions. So fewer yep. Likert scale or yes or no and more just listening. Yep. Um, can anybody identify the, the, the sort of like fear that I have about that practice and its efficacy? She has one. and guns in their house because you will come take their children. Okay. So like here, these are things that we have to understand culturally is that there have been systems in place that ask these kind of questions, people who look like you asking these kinds of questions to communities that we're trying to help right now. And that to them means you're going to come take my kids, you're going to come take my voucher, you're going to, we have to, a we have to learn how to ask those questions without asking those questions or ask them in a way that they feel safe that this is only about treatment and receiving some help. This is not going to go to, and we can tell them all day long. We can tell them all day long. This isn't, this isn't going to be used against you, but guess what? That has happened to them over and over and over for generations. And so we have to think creatively about how do we get to the root of those answers. Dr. Vick. Sir, may I ask a question? Love that. So, uh, but I have a gun in my house because where I live, it's not safe and I need to have a gun. And if they know I don't have a gun, I'm, you know. Yeah. And, and so, like, lots of young people, I, they're getting arrested for guns. They're coming into the DA's office for guns. I'm, I tell them they're bad for having guns and I'm going to incarcerate you for having guns. Is that having any impact on them? No. So what did I start to do? I asked questions like, why do you have a gun? Oh, I feel unsafe. I feel unsafe. I can do that where I'm at because you're kind of already there. We're already having these conversations. But where you're at, having the conversation about not judgmental about having a gun or living in an unsafe place, but the, the question then becomes, what can I do in my, my role here today to figure out a way to make you feel safe? What does that look like to you? And asking questions about building safety in home. Dr. Garcia, do you have any examples of uh, interventions or community-based solutions to providing that amount of safety so people feel less apt to pick up a gun and more likely to pick up a phone? Well, one of the interventions that have been, has been demonstrated uh, is then sort of developing this concept called collective efficacy that I've alluded to. Uh, and we don't, I don't want to take up the time, but there is an approach in, neighborhood, in a neighborhood uh, that has been actually uh, shown to be very effective, not just in the United States, but also globally. And that is measuring something called collective efficacy, uh, and to the extent that it's not there, cultivating it and nurturing it. And it has to do also with nonprofit organizations, even barbershops in the neighborhood. There's always a barbershop and a beauty parlor, uh, utilizing those organizations to actually help build collective efficacy. To the extent that there is elevated collective efficacy in a neighborhood with equal degrees of poverty, that neighborhood that has the high, higher collective efficacy has lower violence, you feel safer, and we don't see the propensity as far as needing to have a gun when you walk the streets. All right, we have five minutes left, somehow. Uh, and so I just want to like rapid fire so people walk away with action steps because I really want to get to the commitment piece of it. Uh, just hit you with these three T's. All right, three action steps. Number one, talk about it. There's lots of research that shows that institutions have mindset shifts about implicit bias and racial unawareness just by talking about it. And again, you just have to find the, t the, the time as not just uh, organizations, but also as individuals to talk about it. So how, so how do you do that in your, in your places? Get around content. Have a book club. Have a documentary screening. 
have a guest speaker come in and talk about the situation, talk about these issues, not just once a year, not during Black History Month, please, not on Martin Luther King Day, please, make it part of every single month you have something revolving around a book, a documentary, a podcast, listen to it together and talk about it. You're doing it right now. And there are guided questions that you can have. There are facilitators that you can get to help you have these conversations. Talk about the problem. Number two, training. Uh, all of you have to get trained, I'm assuming, once in a while during your careers, maybe more regularly than that. Making sure and requesting one that training involves stuff around the racial history of the United States of America. The effects of poverty and trauma, the effects of housing on public health. Have people request, demand these trainings be part of the other trainings that you get, which are probably about how do you operate, how do you prescribe, how do you diagnose. This has to be the fiber of your training, and there's lots of trainings that we don't get, like how do you motivationally interview a person so that you can get to those answers without asking them how, what, what's the, what, what drugs do you have in your house. All right? And number three, and this is the most important one, because this is the one that the, the history and the, the structures that have been set up, this is how we got so f pulled apart. You have to leave the hospital. You have to leave. If you care about this issue, then you're not going to learn about your community by having them come to you and asking them questions. Figure out ways as individuals, as organizations, as an association to make it part of your culture that you are leaving the hospital and going to the communities that you serve. And there's lots of ways to do that. There are volunteer opportunities at every school and homeless shelter and food bank and reservation that you can possibly think of. There are opportunities to go inside of juvenile detention facilities and talk to kids. That's probably the best way that you will learn about the best things that you can do for your job is asking them, like, what can we do the next time? Volunteering opportunities, visiting opportunities, community events, community talks, imbibe, ask people, hey, is there something going on in your neighborhood that I might be able to attend this weekend? And here, here's the real kicker, bring your kids. Because what we know, and the reason that we are affected by these narratives is that it didn't start when we were grown-ups. Just because we've been devoid of other people who look like us and live like us doesn't mean that we weren't learning about them since we were babies. And what we know now is that children as, as uh, young as three months old start associating the person's race with their behavior. We're literally learning this stuff since the time we were three months old. And so bring your children as young as you possibly can to learn about other communities because research shows that we can fundamentally change how they feel about race by the time they're six years old if we immerse them in environments. We have a question over here. Yes. This is Hari Charan from Charleston, West Virginia. My question is, how do I establish street cred? Now, I ask all these questions, and they say, Doc, how would you know? I mean, you never went through this. Yeah. How do I? There, you know, people, like, people have this sense, it's like, I need to be like you to understand you. Uh, one kid, Giovanni Morris, uh, a kid that I worked with for years. Uh, you know, like, I don't have street cred either. Honestly, like they look at me and they're like, we know that you didn't grow up around here. <laughs> you can have all the dreads you want, bro. Like, we know. And I, so I asked him, I'm like, is this, is this why young men aren't listening to me? He's like, no, dude. Like, everybody listens to you. Real, real sees real, is what he said to me. And so please don't try to get street cred by, like, turn your hat around and, like, sitting in the chair backwards and trying to qu quote, like, Drake or something. Please <laughs> don't do that. Uh, I asked tens of thousands of people in the system, like, how are we failing you? How are we failing you? Number one answer is treat me like a human being. Number two answer is treat me with dignity. Nobody said be me. Nobody said be like me. It's see me as a human being. And to do that, I have to understand and be able to articulate that I am different than you, that I don't understand anything that you're going through. That's why this, the, this relationship is different. I'm learning from you to help, to help me help you. Street cred comes from just being really who you are and talking to somebody like they're a human being, not a patient. All right? Thank you. For the last five minutes, we want you to make a commitment. And that's what your pieces of paper are for. So if you use your paper to take notes, just let us know. We still have more. But for this part, I really want you to have two pieces, the white on top of the yellow so that we get the copy on the back. 
But this is the time to make a commitment. Make a commitment to yourself, make a commitment to APSA. What are you going to do next week? What do you hope to have done by next APSA meeting, APSA 51? And what do you want us to do? And while you're thinking this and writing it, we are also going to come around to the tables and have people share that with us because we want the collective wisdom uh, to be shared. So raise your hand. The, those with the microphones are going to come by and uh, get your answers. And I'm going to hand out paper for those who need paper. So if you need paper, raise your hand right now and I'll come around. Okay. Remember, a commitment is not like one uh, school visit. A commitment is be this being part of your culture. Do we have some volunteers who are willing to share ideas? Dr. Downer. So one thing that we talked about at our table was being complicit in continuing the narrative ab about um, deserving to be a victim. So for instance, someone comes in shot to the trauma bay because two dudes jumped him as he was on his way out of church and changing that narrative for our, um, especially modeling better behavior for people who are in um, training programs, medical school and such, to understand that we are, um, we are part of the problem in that situation. So. Baked, baked into that commitment is understanding the racial narratives that we have about young black men and violence. We don't feel that because we actually believe that I'm more violent than the next person. We believe that because we've been fed racial narratives since the jump about black boys and violence, and that's where that deserving language comes from. Hi, Cynthia Reyes. Um, so I, I grew up in these impoverished areas, and I, and I very well understand the complexity of all of the things that have to be fixed in Brooklyn, where I grew up. But I live in Orlando now, and it's a different environment, and there are different challenges. So I'm going to contact nonprofits in the area and, and see how I could join them or supplement their work, but more importantly, have a better understanding of the, ch of the challenges in the neighborhood where I work. There are so many resources in our communities that we don't interact with because we don't know that they're out there. Going out and learning about them uh, is great. Referring people out to them is great. But you, ha you literally have places called waiting rooms in your buildings. And people are literally just waiting. Why aren't we using that time and that space to have these programs come in and talk to people about the services they're offering. Adam, I'm, I'm going to speak to something that I spoke to you about before. Sure. In order to take care of the kids and to have more diversity among ourselves, we have to lift the people up. The only way you lift these kids up is to be around them. You have to be there. In the city of Boston, where I spent 10, 10 years of my life, we had 34 pediatric surgeons for 625,000 people. In Brooklyn, there's two and a half million people. In the Bronx, there's two million. We have three or four pediatric surgeons. In order to make sure kids go to bed with food in their brains so they can take and learn the next day, you have to be there. They have to see you. You have a green-eyed, pasty, white Irish boy taking care of these people like they're your own. They know it, and they, they know you care. That lifts people up. Yep but you have to be there. Yep. This organization as a group should have a committee or should have some work, workforce whereby we take people, we put them in the Detroits, in the Oaklands, the Bronx, and you don't need to go off to foreign countries to take care of the folks. You can take care of our own right here who need us Say and can cut down on these things. Say it. Great. Love that solution. I'm June, I'm uh, one of the fellows in DC. One of the things that I think you know, we haven't mentioned enough here is how much we really need to appreciate the teachers in the, in the schools and really, I mean, even in the most privileged areas, you see teachers that are struggling to give kids supplies so that they can actually go through the lessons and everything. So you can't even imagine what it's like for places that really don't have you know, that privilege, that don't have the good school budgets and adequate. So it's really, I think that's one of the thing, areas where we can truly contribute is to, you know, 
find ways that where teachers are struggling, find areas where we can contribute to, you know, giving them supplies and lessons and everything like that so that they can, you know, it all starts with education, like you said, leading to meaningful jobs and everything like that. So I think that's some, a place where we can really make an impact. And when you're saying that, uh, I think about, so like teachers, again, uh, weren't trained to deal with young people coming to school with trauma. They weren't, they, they never are, they weren't. Uh, it would be great to see collaborations between your folks and them, even if that's you guys running a training to fe make pe teachers feel empowered, that the answer that I have for this young person who's acting this way might not be the school resource officer suspension. I might call that pediatric surgeon that I know and see what they, they think. All right, that's how you make community. That's how we collaborate. What else? Commitments. Commitments. Um, the thing that I'm going to do next week, actually yes. tomorrow, and I encourage everybody else to do it, is to take retake the implicit bias test, the Harvard one. It's very easy. I've done it before, but I've had to check my own bias. Even being a black female pediatric surgeon, everyone would assume that I don't have bias maybe, but I have certainly caught myself in situations where I admit kids with trauma and I say, oh, but the parents seemed so nice and wholesome. And we can't overlook that and assume that we just have to treat every kid the same, essentially. So, Super easy commitment, everyone. You can do that in your Uber. That's where I do most of my work these days. For my commitment for the next year, um, I want to commit to doing one activity in my community outside of my hospital community, but in the larger community, one activity per month. Great. Love that. Concrete. We can hold you accountable. Bring people with you. Uh, where are you? Marshfields, Wisconsin. Is that near Ann Arbor? Oh, all right. You guys are off. You guys are off the hook. I was about to pull you in. Yes, sir. I'm from Central California. Uh, my name is Jim Pierce, and um, we serve a very large area, um, a very Hispanic population. And uh, I'm going to be asking my patients what it took to get to us. I'm going to ask them, how did they have to take a day off work? Um, are they at risk for losing their job? Um, you know, what, how did they travel? Um, what can we do to get to them to help them, uh, help take care of them? It, will it be helpful if we come out to, the, to provide care in their area? Um, what would help them best? Uh, that is so profound. Transportation is, is hurting so many of our patients and asking questions like that to get a landscape of like, because what you're doing is collecting data really. Establishing patterns and trends and then coming up with a solution. Like, we can talk to somebody about that. If that's the issue, then maybe we change the paradigm and we start going out in the community. It's a great suggestion. Uh, I think one of the things that appealed to me was exposing my kids. I think I probably protect them from this and, I, and that's probably the wrong thing to do. So my commitment would be to expose my kids over this next year to more of this. We have this terrible habit in this country, and we've done it forever, of not exposing our children to the real truths. Uh, we must, because of the research about what we know about kids in their association race, we're gonna go here, here, here and, then and then last. All right, John Groner, Columbus, Ohio. Um, so my commitment is to do cycling at night in the inner city. I actually have a graduate student who's uh, pitched that project, and the one which I think would be really great, and my wife's coming with. Uh, the one. Yeah, we have a tandem. The other thing I just want to point out, most of us work at large nonprofit hospitals. They have a fiduciary responsibility to provide community benefits. And my hospital is gigantic and extremely wealthy. So, you know, one of my commitments is to talk to some leadership about what exactly we're doing in the community. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. My name is Shayu. I'm a general surgery resident in Oregon. One of the things that I'm going to do next week is to be more curious about my patients that are coming through EGS with IV drug use and abscesses, just to be more curious to, as a way to address my implicit bias. Uh, what I hope to have done by next May is to evangelize the messages I've heard here at APSA to my residents, my co-residents, through um, giving a, a capstone talk at our uh, resident conference to kind of, and then give them a, the toolkit they need to uh, translate their, their passion into action. Amazing, I have, a, I have a toolkit that I can send to anybody that has the content, like sort of content and suggestions about community-based activities. So I'll, I'll make sure you guys get that on the app. I'm sure you have an app. 
Last comment here. Yep. Um, I'm Sarah Rasmussen. I'm a pediatric surgeon at the University of Virginia, and um, what I the commitment I started, and I'm going to try to get braver, is the um, getting uh, stepping out of my comfort zone when talking with my colleagues, and I hear them say s statements that are full of implicit bias, and um, helping keep the needle centered not just on you know me being a, a white female, but helping um, m by practicing more intersectionality, helping women of color and other minorities um, get the advantages that I have had. Amazing. Uh, those of you who did not get to articulate your commitments, I'm, I'm assuming that's just because we ran out of time, not because you don't have one. Um, we're going to be back here next year asking people how they did. Se like, seriously. All right. Thank you, everyone, for the participation in the workshop. Please, before you leave, a couple things. Make sure that piece of paper tells, you, tells us what you want us to do next. So leave me the yellow sheet of your carbonless paper, but we want to know what do you want APSA to do next. This is a journey. We're going to take it together. So please leave us some, uh, some advice. And then please do not leave the meeting yet. There's still an afternoon full of fun. From here you can go out and get your box lunch. And then there is uh, a great session on the future of APSA, future of research, education, and clinical surgery. And of course we talked about the future of advocacy and uh, communal working. The Robert Gross debate. Should you or should you not encourage your child to go into pediatric surgery? And finally, one final PED talk at the end of the day by Joseph Sacrin. So please, there's still a lot more at the APSA meeting this afternoon.